Okay, we ready? Just about. Let's go. Right, so it's episode 11. I have got Jake Johnston on today. Um, Jake is the stepson to the legendary bass player of our favourite band, Bon Jovi. He has kindly said that he will feature on today's podcast. Um, as most of us know, um, Jake was part of or, you know, supported the band um, on this current tour. really heard of because yeah. if he had a cooler name, it would have been, I think it would have remembered more. And I remember being on a road trip with my dad and I saw a TV commercial for a show called Killjoys. And at the time I was working with Desmond Child and we were really, um, he was like, man, you guys come with a different band named Jake Johnson. That sounds like you're a Mormon missionary. As I just because I'm from Utah, I have like a Mormon missionary name, you know? So <laughs> I, I got him for something cooler, man. And I thought Jake J and the Killjoys. I'm like, that makes total sense. There's a lot of J's and K's. It's, it's very catchy. I, I like that. That's cool. I drew up the logo, which everyone can see on the website. It's kind of psychedelic. It's got like the Beatles influence on the killed words. It's got like the Jimi Hendrix warp 60 letters um, for Jake J and the. And I was like, that looks really fucking cool. I, I, I dig that. And then it kind of spiraled more and more and more. And I was doing these pop songs. And I was working with Desmond. Like, you know, shit was hitting the fan with my personal life, dating and experiencing and being broke and having to find jobs, and, you know, just trying to get going. Mm. And it took a long time. And it was a lot of, there was a lot of putting my foot through the wall until I finally grasped reality. And um, at that time, too, my parents, they went to a, this is funny, they went to a Rob Zombie concert. And Huey is not into that music at all. And you know, he loved the Beatles, the Yardbirds, the Stones, Steely Dan. And he went to Rob Zombie and says, man, this guy's awesome. And they were both like, man, you know, you could really do that. And they said, you know, for a long time we've told you, clear of horror in your music but now we kind of get it wow. we, i think you should kind of embrace it and i was like that's cool and i always 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 kind of looking for parents approval and um uh, i guess if you want to dare use the word validation right uh, even though your parents always love you, you still kind of look for their validation yeah and once i heard that like go ahead you can do monster stuff i went full-fledged and i was writing monster songs Half of them we kept, half of them are now kind of sitting there. And they're not great, but they're still cool songs. And I was really happy because I was able to write dark stories of my personal life and include horror influence. Yeah. Like I have a song called Guillotine where the uh, the chorus line is, I won't stick my neck out for you just to be guillotine. It's about sticking your neck out for people and yeah. they take advantage of you. And the rest of the song talks about... Um, the executions of witches in Salem because I find I'm really into witches and I, I don't dabble with it but I study the occult so I, I I find that very interesting to listen about witches and dark history like that so I include that House of Snakes of course you can use your imagination there where it's about your life being literally infested like your life your house is infested with vermin with yeah. bad things and you got to burn it down so when I had these songs, I was really angry, really angry with life. I was depressed. Um, I just couldn't get a grip, a grip on reality. And I was like, did I say grip, a grip, grip. <laughs> I, I, I was, I said, I said grip. I said, I was trying to say uh, a grip and grip at the same time. <laughs> I was trying to get a, 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 a crap on reality. And uh, I went to the studio and I was working with my producer, Jim Lightman. And we were coming up with songs, you know, with songs you want to use. And we were playing, we were passing a bass back and forth, playing our favorite bass lines. And I was playing, you know, Living on a Prayer, Keep the Faith, Detroit Rock City, you know, certain bass lines that really stuck out to me. And I, I was trying to play them this bass line that kind of sounded like prayer, kind of sounded like a David Bowie song. And he goes, what is that? And I said, that's my song, Relit Cigarette. And he goes, sing it. And I said, I sang the uh, chorus line, which is, Broken hearted, ain't that a shame that the spark never turned into a flame because a relit cigarette never tastes the same. Um. And he was like, holy fuck, why aren't we doing that song? And I was like, because we're trying to be heavier. We, you know, I, it's kind of like a pop song. He says, fuck that, we'll make it a rock song. We're doing that song. And I was like, all right. So we're going back to it. And I realized it's okay to have softer songs. And I was really worried about it sounding too country or too pop or too this or too that. But then I listened to Avenged Sevenfold 
and they have a song called Dear God. And you listen to that, and it sounds like a country song. It's got lap steel, but it's also got the neoclassical walk-down guitar stuff that they do. And I'm like, you know what? It's okay to have different styles because that makes you a musician. Yeah. It shows your influence. And you can be heavy as hell, and then you can have a song where it's just like, let's throw some country in there. Let's throw pop in there. Let's make it cool. Like, even if you listen to, like, another one is a Five Finger Death Punch, Wash It All Away, that's got, like, a, like an EDM disco dance beat. Oh. It's kind of like a Boots and Cats dance beat, and you're like, that's freaking cool. Yeah. So we're doing our song Lost Boys, which I wrote with Billy Falcon, who has done a lot of the last couple records with Bon Jovi. And the first time we did it, it was really soft. It was really slow. It was just not. It was just dragging along. So I tracked it faster, added a drop beat riff. So it sounds like a split knot riff almost. And it's got these guitar harmonies that are very Avenged Sevenfold. Give it a disco beat with like R and B, like a dun da da dun da da dun. Like a kind of like a dare say Iron Maiden uh, trot okay. bass line with a guitar backing it up. And I was like, this is like disco metal, and I love it. <laughs> this is cool, and that's kind of what's been going what's been going on. And I mean, you hear me? I ramble about it because it's so exciting. But, it's, I I can really go, yeah, this is so cool. Listen to this. This is so rad. And it's got monsters, and it, it sounds like disco, and it's it's, it's awesome. So, and everything just is just coming along. It's great. Day by day, it's better and better and better. It's uh, it sounds like you're very. I wouldn't say the the the, the way it's the, the wrong way. It's probably satisfied. That's not the right way that I think I should be using. But it seems like you you kind of content with how things are going at the moment. And one thing that I picked up on was that you said that you know you, you kind of in the face. People were like, you know, this, this isn't good. That this doesn't sound right. How did that like? How did that make you feel like hearing that from? From, from other people, do you know what I mean? Because obviously, they, like, you know, if I ever heard anyone saying about my work, how it doesn't look good or, um, you know, it's not right, I'd, like, I'd take that to heart. But, but I know that would spare me on to, to do better. I presume, judging by uh, how well you're doing at the moment, that that's the same attitude you've got. Well, I, I think what you, I, here's what happened. When I did those first tracks back when I was, I guess, like 15, 16 years old, I played them for Ovi, who does, he's been a yeah. lifelong friend of Ovi, and he works for the Bon Jovi organization as mm -hmm. an engineer. And he's great, you know, and uh, he's a dear family friend, but we sent him the songs, and he is, I love Ovi, but he is a fucking sadist when it comes to a song, because he will listen to it, and he will play into it. If it's a great song, yeah. he'll tell you it's a great song, you're going to have a hit. If it sucks, you're going to know that it sucks. And I love that. It's yeah. like, all right. And then when he says something that the song sucks, I just get that arch. I'm like, oh, you son of a bitch. I'm going to show you. And I, <laughs> oh, and I told him that too. He knows that. Yeah. So I was like, I'll show you. I'll show you this fucking song. So <laughs> I really had to get mean with it. So having that, he, he said something that always stuck out to me. And he always said, no one is going to say that their baby is ugly. And I was like, wow, that, that's beautiful. <laughs> and, and then I looked back to it, and I'm like, that's a great quality to have when you're able to say this song sucks. Because you sit there and say, oh, this is great, this is great. And I was even talking to Billy Falcon today. We had a coffee, uh, we had a coffee meeting, and he said, you know, you can you can make a cake that you think is awesome, but then people are only going to have one bite of it. Yeah, you know. You gotta make something that's gonna make people want to come back for more and more and more and more and more. And I've all the thing is with Bon Jovi is that some people have just been, oh, he got this because he's a Bon Jovi kid. I'm like, no, 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 no. Yeah. The Bon Jovi organization, you earn it. It is nothing's given. There's no golden ticket. There's no out of the kindness of my heart. You have to. I mean, I was trying to open for Bon Jovi for years before we got this the chance. Yeah. It just we weren't ready. And that's a fact. I mean, John saw the potential there, and he just said, keep going, keep going, keep going. Now you're ready. Yeah. And even then, when we did those tracks, we really weren't ready because it was we were coming up with new stuff. But it's also okay because then people can see the evolution. And then if we do get big, they can say, oh, I remember seeing Jake J and the Killjoys when they were um, when they were doing more poppy stuff. I mean, yeah. Kind of like the same way when people say, oh, I remember seeing Pantera when they were a glam band. If you really want to talk about evolution, that's the definition of evolution, you yeah. know, Pantera with their glam days. So that's, you know, it's good to learn those lessons early. So it's like, I'm not learning those lessons now. And 
I'm regret I'm still on top of it. I'm always trying to improve and get validation, and I'm never satisfied with the product. And it drives myself. It drives me crazy. But also, if you're satisfied with the project, you're never going to want to progress. Even with done tracks, I still am never satisfied because I want to always better. Yeah. Which, which, which is good. As an artist, you can never be satisfied. Uh, as you said there, you know, obviously you're going to get people saying, you know, oh, he's, being, he's being given this, as you said, because the Bon Jovi organisation and the links he's got. And I, I have to disagree, obviously. I, I don't think that, um, like, as you said there, you know, being a fan of the band, I, I've kind of understood that they can be quite hard, you know, you've got it in and I think that's that's perfect. I think that's how it should be. But one thing that you've got, which is I think is fantastic, is the people around you, I suppose. So you as you said, you've got the likes of John and you know, you've had Richie on one of your songs and you've got Desmond Chad and Billy and Obi and obviously Hugh. Um obviously that that little circle that you've got is is what only not only what something that I dream of being a fan obviously of, of Bon Jovi, but what musicians would dream of, you know, having that little circle get, to get advice to be told that something sounds shit when it probably doesn't, but you need that kick up the ass to, you know, give you a little bit more of a boost to make that song even better. And I think, like, I think that's, I think that's a brilliant little circle to have myself. Um, obviously, how, how do you feel having that that type of circle and getting advice from from these legends? Let's say, you know, it, it's great to have these. Um these influences. It's great to have these, hold on a second. Oh, the sound's gone a little bit. <laughs> Sorry about that. Anyway. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. I, had to, I had to take that. Anyway. Um, what was the question again? I, I got distracted by something shiny. What was the last part of that? <laughs> so like, uh, you've got this like nice group of people, uh, a great circle. Oh, goodbye. Goodbye. Sorry. Um, Sorry, you have to forgive me. I have a very rare condition of ADD called ADOS, which stands for attention deficit. Ooh, shiny. So, um, with the advice, they're cruel. They really, I mean, the advice I get, they're always going to, John especially knows how to say those right things. Yeah. He knows how to say it. He sees me and he knows I'm, I'm trying. I'm making it. And he loves that. He loves to see me work hard and earn my way. And he, he's always asking me, what's Jake up to? What's he doing? What's, how's he doing? What's going on? And having advice from all these different people, you know, Desmond Child, Doc McGee, um, all these guys that have been veterans forever and ever and ever, it's really, really cool to see, especially people that have seen the evolution from records to digital. Yeah. That's cool to see. And because these guys, when they saw that change through the grunge era, through the digital era, they didn't die. They yeah. survived. Yeah. Bon Jovi survived. So... There are people that just go off. I don't know what to tell you about the modern era, you know, but these guys are the guys to yeah. talk to. And I pick their brains all the time. And it has been difficult to kind of track them down and pin them down so you can talk because there's always something going on, always a record, always a tour, always something going on. Yeah. But when I do I get a chance to talk to them, they fill me in, they just say, here's what you got to understand. You're going to make this much money, you got to do. You gotta do this, you gotta understand this, you gotta understand this, you know, it's not good enough. Blah, blah. And they tell you, you have all this advice coming in that's professional, it's honest, they're gonna tell it as it is. If you suck, you're gonna know you suck. If you're great, you're gonna know that you're great. And, you know, John has supported us, Doc has supported us, but I think they're just waiting for the right thing. And they, Doc even said, come back, I, actually, I played him some of the songs like, oh, what's stopping me? And I think he saw it as like, you're trying to come to Nashville and treat stuff. And for a while, I was trying to be country. Mm. Because I thought I had the voice for it. But then I did the song, and I was like, nope, can't do it. So I, ha I have a lot of country roots. Just living in horse farms and everything. Be going to rodeo. So I thought it could make sense. But it's also, I'm, I'm the black sheep of the family. I really am. I'm literally wearing all black now as we speak. I'm the only one that wears eyeliner. I'm covered in tattoos. I wear all black. I love horror movies. But everyone else is into Horses and um, it's just a very, uh, very clean and straight way of life. And I'm like the weird one. I think it's it, Don't get me wrong, but I'm still the weird one. <laughs> and, yeah, it's it's it, it's really hard to uh, it's kind of hard to describe. But yeah, I I find this very interesting. As I said, I know obviously 
with the links and that, obviously, I want to get on to uh, being the, you know, what, the, the support band for Bon Jovi and that. And I want to get get through the, you know, the fans' questions and that. But I, I'm finding this really interesting, if you don't mind me asking a little bit more on, oh, on we, yourself. We can, we can keep going. We can, we can keep going as long as you want. Brilliant. Thank you. So the, the next question I'm going to ask is, obviously, you said there that, that John's saying to you, you know, you're doing well, you're doing this. Do you think that he sees a little bit of himself in you? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, because I I noticed too coming up that I saw a lot of people. There was a period there when it was like the late it was like um late two thousands early two thousand and ten where a lot of bands were getting support from big artists. Yeah. Like someone would stick their neck out to help a band, and then they'd do some tours, and then it would kind of die down, you know. And I was too young for that, obviously. And John has seen me, you know, miss that boat. Yeah. When I was too young. And he's seen me really work hard, and I'm trying to make it happen. I'm trying to do everything on my own. So he sees me working as a gopher for the studio. He sees me playing downtown on Broadway and Nashville three times a week, four hour shows, no break. Just go, 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 go. You have to know the songs, do your part, work on your voice, master your craft, sharpen yeah. the pencil. And he's, I think he's, he does see that because I look back on his upcoming and I was like, yeah, I could see, I could see a, a, a resemblance there. Because he's also, he wasn't just like, he wasn't an artist where he was a good artist and then like, he didn't understand the business of it. Yeah. Great. And he knew the business. Yeah. So, which like, which is like a, the perfect storm, the perfect the perfect star because he knew exactly what he needed to do as to be a leader. And he saw that I was trying to be a leader and still am. So I think he sees, he sees the leadership in me, I guess. Because like, you have to. You have to be the leader. I, 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 I am actually, honestly, really finding this interesting. As you said, it's, it, it's, it, it's a great circle for you to have. It really is. And I said, for it, like, obviously, to, to hear that, you think that John sees a little bit of himself in you, like that. That I think that's fun, like amazing to be here, to be honest with you. Um, because obviously to, to us as Bon Jovi fans, he's he's the best. Do you know what I mean? So that that can yeah. only be a good thing to you. Like you know, that's only something that we could dream of that he would see something in us or actually you know compare himself to us or you know anything like that or relate to us. I think that. Uh, for someone who, who we adore, literally, you know, as Bon Jovi fans, we we love John. Um, I think it's, I I think that's a, like a fantastic thing for you to have that. Yeah, it's it's really cool, and the Bon Jovi fans have been great. Everyone's been supportive, and what's funny too, they, you know, going back to the, the point about the whole, you know, oh, it was given thing. Really, the Bon Jovi fans knew. They knew what I had to go through because they know what John is like. Mm -hmm. John sees, you know, they see that John, all of his songs work. It's hustle. The American working man, you know, that's what he's all about. And even that same thing goes into the music. If you're not the American working man with a guitar, what are you? Yeah. So the only people that were saying, oh, this is gifted to him were the people that don't understand. So I have, nothing but great things to say about the Bon Jovi fans. They're awesome. And we're, we're getting emails all the time saying, are you coming over to London? Are you coming over to Australia? Are you coming to somewhere in the States? Are you coming to, to Canada or wherever? And I'm just like, that's so cool. Yeah. That's a, are really interesting. And I even see a lot of pages that are interested in uh, uh, Jake and Jesse, Stephanie, um, David's kids. Like everyone, like, everyone likes to keep in touch with what's going on because That's all cool. the kids are doing something. Yeah. That's really cool. So each person is kind of different. I remember Colton, I was talking a little while ago. It's fun to catch up with them. All the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Ava, of course, gorgeous. I love her. She's amazing. And she's doing great. She's doing a lot of acting and stuff. And Jesse just got the award for the best wine. Yeah. And it's funny because you listen to John talk about Jesse doing his wine thing. And he's just stepping back. Yeah. Like, that's so cool. Yeah. That's really cool. And everyone's just doing great. It's it's awesome. It is. Uh, it, it, like, it sounds like, obviously, because from the outside looking in, we as Bon Jovi fans always think, you know, uh, do the band beat up for the tour? 
to record the album and then don't bother with each other. That that's obviously what we always question: are they as close as they seem, or you know, whatever else? And I think again, just hearing that's nice to hear because obviously everyone seems to know each other, and I think that that that's a good thing to have. That it goes not just from the band, but it goes to the kids and you know to the wives and and, and obviously everything else. And as you said, there at the Hall of Fame, he's all met up and you know the names it's not like you don't know them and, and uh, as i said i think it's good for for us bon jovi fans to hear that i think we're gonna it, it, we're gonna obviously enjoy listening to, to things like this because it's a question that's always asked how how close are the band actually you know uh that's i, I actually have no idea how to it i never i i wonder that myself because i've always seen um David and Tico, I see, I see everyone there on the road. I do remember, like it was funny back, uh, uh, was it, the year before last? it was the year that we did the we did the Nashville show. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to the Memphis gig to hang out, and then the next day they were like, "Hey, do you want to go to the Gibson factory?" And I was like, "Shit, yeah, I want to go to the Gibson factory." <laughs> and that and that's actually what started my relationship with Gibson. Right. Okay. And um, I play I play Gibson guitars, and I was you know. I, we're just hanging out there and then in watch, you know, Phil and Shanks are always kind of hanging out, you know. I know that Phil and Shanks hang out a lot. Um, uh, I never really, I, that's what I've seen so far. Yeah. Because like me, Huey, uh, Shanks, and Phil will all kind of go and we'll, we'll go to guitar stores or something. We'll yeah. kind of nosy around or we'll do shit. Um, honestly, as far as the other guys, I really don't know. Yeah. I, I really have no idea. Um, because also too, they have families, you of know. Of course, yeah. And they've also been together for how many years? You, know, you hear these stories of them all, all living in a in an apartment, sharing a house, having a you know the band house and the band and everything. So when you, I think when you're at that point, you're just like, you know, I have my family, I have my own kind of thing going on. But then when they're together, they hang out and they're you know. I really don't know how to answer that because I just kind of I just never asked really. But yeah, yeah. What I've seen on the road, they do hang out. And there is love, and there's a brotherhood there, especially backstage. Everyone's hanging out. They're listening to records, and they're watching movies, and they're sharing each other funny pictures and dog <laughs> videos and stuff like that. Also, if you want to get good with someone, show them dog videos. That's the secret. Show them <laughs> dog videos. That's the secret. Forget talking about the band. No, no, no. Don't talk about the band. Talk about dog videos and cars. That's how you get into it. <laughs> Tell you what, the amount of tweets that, that John and the band yeah. are going to get now with dog videos after you've said that. Yes, Bon Jovi fans, please send dog videos to the Bon Jovi. <laughs> yeah, bon Jovi dog videos. Well, it's actually the, the the thing that I picked up on there was that you said Phil and Phil and John Shanks actually are close, and that's one relationship I'd say that I've seen on you know live performances that I watch where you see them really interact with each other. Um, Phil X and John, I think that's a good little relationship that them two have got. Yeah, I mean everyone. Uh, I, I yeah, they, they have a good relationship. I think it's just a mutual interest in guitars, and they're kind of the same, but they're different. Yeah, Shanks is more kind of suave and there. Yeah, where Phil is very outgoing. He's like animal with guitar. Yeah, and, uh, but they still hang out, and they have a they 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 ping pong well off each other because they know their parts, and they're and they're gonna say, you know, they kind of give each other that look of here comes the harmony, yeah. here comes this part, and you just see them almost like being like a conductor with each other. Yeah. It's just good, isn't it? Get a person. Yeah. Well, do you know, obviously, looking at your album before, you've done um, Road, Love and Gypsy with Richie. How was, how was that? I was having Richie on the album. Well, what's funny is I was nagging Richie for a long time to get him on the tracks. And then at that time, too, I was getting Doug Aldridge and a bunch of other guys. And I was thinking, like, this is going to be the record that's going to really get us out there. We're going to we're gonna make it. They have all these rock guys on there. Yeah. So I was contacting Richie, and I was ping I did it back and forth, and I was working with his assistant, Denise, who I adore. I love her to death. And we were just kind of getting Richie. Because he's so busy, too, and it's so hard. One day, I'm sitting there. It's 3 in the morning, and I get a call from Richie saying, I just sent you guitar track to Road Living Gypsy. Let me know what you think. Wow. I'm like, what? Where did this come from? Wow, it's cool. And we'll spend hours talking to each other. Now. I mean, I adore that man. And to have Richie on a track, it's so cool. And I'm, you know, I would love to do another track with Richie. And I've talked about it for a long time to do another, to do a track. We'll have to do another one with, with Alice, because we haven't even done a track with Alice Cooper. But I would love to do one with Alice. 
I'd love to do another one with Richie. Now that we're getting heavier, I would love to have him involved in something that's heavy and kind of cool. Because I, I hear the RSO stuff and he gets kind of heavy. And I'm like, I would love to hear him do some kind of like uh, lay your hands on me solo on a really mean metal song. Like, that'd be so cool. Yeah. And, you know, no one said we wanted to do one song together. We could do as many songs as we want, really. It's just a matter of coordinating and getting them, you know, just where where is he? Is he on vacation? Is he working on an album? Is he doing a benefit? And But to have the song with Richie is so cool. It's, he's Uncle Richie to me. Yeah. And he's done so much for me. I mean, even the fans. It's been a topic of discussion I see on the on the forum. Um, some fans have talked about the Stratocaster, and um, he gave me a Fender. He bought me a Fender Custom Shop Stratocaster, and it's. I don't know how to describe it, but that's probably the greatest Stratocaster I've ever played. I've taken it to people in Nashville, you know, just to get like a setup or something like that, you know, do a few strings and check the neck, and everything. And my tech said, I've worked for Fender, I've worked for Gibson, this is the best sounding Stratocaster I've ever played in my life. Wow. And I told Richie that at the Hall of Fame, I said, this is like a legend in Nashville, this guitar. And he goes, that's because it's got, it's got love in it. Richie Love. And that's what the thing is, I always got to remember Richie Love. And I'm getting, I'm even going to get the guitar tattooed on my arm for Richie. Really? Yeah. That much. And it's a great gift, you know. And even though I'm a huge diehard Gibson fan, that's all I use on stage, it's still cool to have a this amazing strat. And even for a while, I was gonna put stuff in it, make it sound more Gibson S. But I was like, uh, uh-uh. if I change it, I'm gonna lose the magic. Yeah, I'm gonna keep super loving it. So I have this amazing Stratocaster, and we talk guitars all the time, and we we'll call each other. Not even just talk about the band or music. We just talk to shoot the shit because that's what they want to do. I mean. They don't want to talk about the band or this or that. They want to talk about dog videos, cars, their watches, their kids. They want to, they want because they're human. Dog know? videos. <laughs> Can't get that. So Can't get that out of my head. Yeah, yeah, I'm telling you, that, that's the secret. So, <laughs> I mean, Richie, having him on the track is just amazing. And I was, I think, I think we need to do another one together. That would be a lot of fun. It's just a matter of when, where, how. Yeah. So, obviously, yeah. what was it like for you seeing? Richie back with the band at the Hall of Fame because like I I I stayed up obviously as I said to you I'm I'm in the UK so it got streamed at about four o'clock in the morning for me and I stayed up and watched it and I couldn't go to bed because I did have like a bit of an adrenaline rush seeing him back with the band. But then I watched it back, it got aired on UK TV last week and I genuinely got goosebumps. Um uh, and I, I found it quite obviously not em- emotional is probably the wrong word, but y- y- like I had a lump in my throat watching them back, and that that's from just the fans. So how was it for you? Obviously having a relationship, as you said, with with Richie. What was it like seeing him live? You know, in front of your own eyes, seeing him with the band again at the Hall of Fame, which you know is the the the, the, the prize or the the award that Bon Jovi have always wanted. They've always made it clear that, that that's the award that they wanted to get. What was it like for you? Well, there's two moments that wouldn't really sunk in. We, I remember we were at the hotel, and I actually ran into Takumi, his guitar tech, who mm-hmm. was a dear friend of mine. He's helped me with all my gear. And it was funny because they weren't going to let us up in one of the like in this room. We had to go. We walked in the in the lobby, and there's fucking Bon Jovi fans everywhere, out in the street, in the hallway. It was so cool. And we walk in, and people are yelling at me, and I'm like, I'm not famous. I don't know how to handle it. <laughs> and um, I walk in, and I, they like. Sorry, you can't go up unless you have a, a card. And I'm like, uh, offspring, hello. <laughs> and I see Takumi, and he goes, oh, Jake, yeah, come on, they're cool. So we go up, and I said, oh, what's that guitar case you have? And he goes, oh, that's Richie's guitar from he used to use back in the 80s, the Charvel. Okay. And I was like, that's fucking cool. So we're um, going up. We're waiting for everyone. I see my mom. We're all just hanging out. I see the wife. I see the kids. I'm like, hey, how you doing? John walks in, I see Jesse, Jake, and Stephanie, um, Romeo, it was really cool. And I see Richie coming with Ava, and I give him a big hug. Uh, definitely me and Richie are the closest. I mean, of course, I see John, I give him a big hug. I, I, I love John. Yeah. And I see Rick, and I was just like, it's Uncle Richie. And I give him a big hug. And I see Ava, I give her a hug, Denise a hug, it was great. And then it was cool, you know, seeing them all in the same room, because uh, David Bergman was doing pictures. And I was like, that's pretty cool to see them all standing together. 
But the part that sunk in for me was when they said, let's do one with all the kids. So they, they did one where it was like, just the band, the band with the wife, the band with the kids, the band with the kids, and then just the kids. Wow. And when we were there, with the, we were doing the picture with me and the kids. Uh, they had me stand in the back, and Ricky said, Dick's in the back, he's the tallest, and everyone started laughing. So we're standing there, me and my sister and her husband, and I'm there with, you know, Jesse, Romeo, all the kids. And we're looking up, and I see John. Hold on a second. Uh, and I look over, and I see John and Ricky standing there, and they're putting their arms around each other, just grinning. But they're just, that's what means the most to, to them is the kids, their family. And I was like, that's cool to see John and Ricky showing that love together in this little conference room inside of this hotel. And they load us in the van. We get over there. And we're walking around backstage. We get in our seats. We're up in the, the we're up in the balcony, looking down, best seat in the house, looking down, uh, almost threw a lady over the railing because she was standing in the aisle and walking behind you. True story. If you watch the video, you'll probably see her, and you'll see me behind her. It's like, I'm going to jail for throwing this lady over over the railing. So, <laughs> and, and then seeing them on stage together was super cool. You know, I, I it's hard for me because I've never been, I mean, I've always been a fan, but I've never been like, like, a lifelong since the eighties fan because of course I wasn't even conceived until nineteen ninety six. Yeah. So um it was cool. The, the part that got me is when they did when we were up and they were showing all the stuff in the background and then you saw John and Richie sharing the microphone yeah. together. Yeah. And I was like, this is so cool. That was cool. Yeah. That little Beatle sharing the mic moment and I was like, that's rad, man. That was cool. And then afterwards it was great. We had a little after party and there's Gary Cantrell and the Killers and all these guys just hanging out, shooting the shit. I'm seeing Doc McGee, Ken Sunshine, all these guys, and they're saying, "Come, we need you back to Nashville. I want to help you out." You know, all these guys are wanting to support us, and it was great because it was just a night of the band, and it was celebrated perfectly, and it was just awesome. It, it, it was unreal. I, to it, I like it was, it was magic. Yeah, even honestly, as I said, even for me. As a fan, obviously, I was like, you know, I'm thousands of miles away. For me, as a fan, watching that was was just uh, something that, that, obviously, since 2018, that I've dreamed of because obviously, I want I want to see them all together again. But it was it was a totally different feeling. As I said, I got like an adrenaline rush, which I didn't think I'd ever get from seeing them back together. And as I said, you know, for for you to witness that, but you're right in saying that. It, there was a few parts that got me. So obviously the speeches I thought were all of them were absolutely fantastic. Every single speech got me. Um, I just I, thought there my was my favorite so, speech was Lemma. Like, uh, with the bowling, about the bowling ball. Yeah. The bowling ball. Yeah. And you see John like the part where John is just hunched over, yeah. laughing his ass off, looking over at Richard. Uh, like, exactly. That's like, it. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's exactly like, the part. So cool. Yeah. That and, that that's exactly it. And it was cool, you know, with Huey being, uh, you know, with Huey, of course, probably the other question, too, on Twitter. I was going through the Twitter stuff, looking at the questions. Um, uh, seeing, you know, Huey with his in involvement and with his position with the band. Uh, so as far as the Hall of Fame is concerned, uh, when they first announced Bon Jovi was getting in, it was just going to be the original product. And Huey was just like, Whatever, it's kind of what it is. He was trying, you know, he was just trying, you know, just to not care. But like, we could all tell that he cared. And then for Christmas, um, it was right before Christmas, um, mom came into the, and she was crying. And she said, Huey, you're getting into the Hall of Fame. And he goes, what? How do you know this? And she goes, all the fans on Twitter are talking about it. And so Huey calls John, and he goes, God Damn it, she spoiled the surprise. He goes, what do you mean? That was going to be your Christmas present. Wow. I was, and I guess what happened was he sent him a framed picture of his letter to the Hall of Fame saying, we need to have Huey involved. So he really went out of his way to get Huey involved. As far as Huey being involved from the beginning, I know that he did run. I talked to him about this. Cause I had several Bon Jovi uh, tribute shows, and I've done with my Broadway band. And looking back, um, I was talking to him about it. He did run away, and the rest, of the rest of the first two records, he didn't do. But then he came in to do a full with. He did all the recording from Slippery on, except for the Young Guns record, which is kind of an animal on, on its own. 
But he did run away. That was the first one he did, then nothing, and then the break on. And then he came in after Crossroad as a studio and stage performer. Yeah. And he was cool with everything that he did because what he was, he just wanted to be a player. And he's worked with Alice Cooper, Cher, Ringo Starr, Willie Nelson, Gladys Knight in the Pip. He was in a bunch of R&B bands, and, you know, a bunch of blues bands. He was just working. I don't think, the thing is, too, Huey never stops and thinks about it. He just goes, I'm a session player. I'm getting called in for Cher or Bon Jovi. And he was with, he was working in, you know, he was with Cher doing stuff with Dave Amato, who's a, you know, of course, dear family friend. I love Dave. And Dave. And so I, I, I think, you know, his involved me. Just like sitting there in a studio one day and you have a young kid come in and say, hey, I'm John, do you want to work on this song with me? What's song called? Runaway. Mm -hmm. And then who would have thought that would spiral into this great big thing that it is now? It's like, holy shit, I'm getting inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because of this. I think there was a lot involved with it. It was cool. I think Huey, um, I think the real, the, the, um, the emotion of it all sat in when he was being inducted and he just goes, Wow. Okay. Yeah. Now I get it. It's cool because he, he just saw it as no matter how big or small the gig is, have it, have it, it was playing with me at a pizza shop or it's being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He always saw it as a gig. Yeah. The gig, the gig, and he taught me that you know where not all gigs are going to be Budokan or Madison Square Garden. There's going to be gigs where you're literally killing cockroaches on the stage, which I have done. <laughs> and, and so he taught me that and. It's cool to see where it sits now. Yeah. Because I think finally sunk in like I'm in the Hall of Fame. I'm in Bon Jovi. It's like I think you always knew he was a part of Bon Jovi, but now it's like it really, 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 really sank in. Yeah. He knew that he was a part of it, but now it's like this is my life, which is a whole, you know, it's a whole different story now. Because it's, I mean. It, I think it's really just sunken in. I think it's always been sunken in, but now it's like even deeper. Yeah. So, but that's what I, you know, that's my opinion about it. I guess. The the mic keeps going a little bit low, just to just to let you know, it keeps going up and then down. Um, so sometimes it's quite hard to, to make out. Just 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 let you know. Um, okay. That's that's perfect. Sure I, I'm, I'm, I'll try to keep my my hand still <laughs> close to my face. So obviously, like you said, they you know like. John Bon Jovi there, what, what he's done for you in terms of sending a letter, because obviously there are bands out there, or, or lead singers, or, you know, the, the owners of, of bands and, and, and everything else, you know, they, they would, they'd be happy with just getting their own nomination, let's be honest, so there's some people out there, so for John to do that, obviously, and, and really try and get Hugh into it, it's that, that like, that's fantastic, I mean, I, I do remember hearing that, um, but obviously to hear it from yourself is, is totally different to, to reading it on Twitter or whatever I've, I've seen it but, but like what a nice surprise what a nice thing to do from him yeah I mean John's he's great he, he'll do like little surprises and stuff like that once in a while where it's like, like wow what a just awesome awesome guy he's, he'll, he'll pull stuff like that all the time and it's like wow you're, you're awesome he's just he's the best he's great I'm going to ask you, obviously, you said um, you seen, you know, when we were us get performed. So obviously that was like an, uh, that was written for, wasn't it? That was, that was made for the, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, so what do you think of This House and Offer Sale as an album? Because obviously you've said, you know, you, you've got like a kind of influence with the likes of Green Day and, and Avenged, which are obviously heavier bands than Bon Jovi. So what do you think of This House is Not For Sale as an album? I like it because it's cool to watch Bon Jovi where for a while there it was like you, know, you have um, Have a Nice Day, Lost Highway, The Circle, What About Now, where, these, where it, it's the classic Bon Jovi where it's like the American working man, it's about love, it's about struggle, and Gina. But then you have the tough not for sale, which I really think is different in all together where it really shows John of what have we been up to. I think especially after all that went on with Richie departing the band, he knew he had to come up with something that was totally different than the last record. And there was a grittiness to it. There's a fuzz to it. There's that fuzzy, nasty tone to it that just shows the grit and 
and like even said, you know, I'm going gray and, you know, I'm, I'm getting old and I'm, you know, this has not for sale, you know, this still, no matter what happens, like he's always said that, you know, he's always said, you know, I'm, this is who I am now and he's evolved. And he just, that's one thing about, that's cool about John is that he's always changed with the time. It was never like bands in the eighties where they try to hold on to their youth and the next thing you know, they're playing the bar and grill rather than selling on Madison Square Garden anymore, where John, you have to evolve. And so it's cool to see this where John, he's writing the songs for his fans that are now parents. Yeah. I think they wanted to hear an album that was for people that are really starting to feel older and they're feeling, it was a very mature album. And like Born Again Tomorrow, that was, a, a, that's probably the best, that's the, by far the best music video because it tells the story of a person going through youth where, you know, the kid gets caught masturbating and then he's, with some girl, then they're getting pregnant, and then they're, you know, their family, and then she dies of cancer, and then he starts drinking, and his daughter's saying, No, you gotta stop drinking, and he's his grandkid, then he dies. Yeah. And it's like, I, I, I didn't need to fucking cry. Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate that. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. I'm, I'm sad now. Appreciate that. So, that, I, it's cool to see this record, and it definitely had an influence on the new stuff as far as grit and learning the evolution. And, and also, part two to this question, I saw on Twitter, people said about the, uh, about the Bon Jovi influence on my writing. Yes, there has been Bon Jovi influence on the writing. Um, I had to be careful because I've caught myself using the same Bon Jovi formula on like one song for all my songs. Yeah. Where he has a for formula that's completely different for each song. I would take a handful of my favorites that would sound kind of in the same ballpark region, use that same formula, and use it over and over and over and over again. And then people were telling me, you gotta be careful because you're using the same formula and the, you know you're not using the formula right because john he has the key changes and the arrangements and the melodies that are amazing and each one's different but if you take that and you try to replicate it it's not going to be the same it's not going to be as magical because john yeah when i was and as i started digging i just kind of left laid back and stopped overthinking stuff and just let it happen I noticed I was using the same Bon Jovi formula in a melodic sense and as a structure sense, but I was also throwing in stuff that was a little bit more from the heavy side, a little bit more off the wall stuff and throwing in different styles where I had a song, you know, Relay Cigarette, of course, you have that song where I, it was originally called Howling For You. And as time progressed, and I, of course, me never, me never being satisfied, I was able to take that song and it became like me trying to do a Bon Jovi song to so sounding like Dick J and the Killjoys. Mm. It's a lot grittier and it's a lot nastier. And I think I'm always going to have that pop influence and structure from Bon Jovi, but I have to add the dirt and the grit and the nasty. Because that's what I'm all about. I'm all about dirt. Yeah. Grind, distortion, metal, and that needs to be in my style, or it's not going to be authentic. And I think people are listening to this new stuff and saying, "This sounds more authentic. This sounds more like you." And it's working. Yeah. So I think Bon Jovi has Bon Jovi has absolutely had an influence. Um, dare say almost too much of an influence, but the most influence it's come from is business. The business of Bon Jovi is that I am strictly. I am reading the book on Bon Jovi business and how to run it, how to be a leader, how to be the man, how to be the John of this band. Yeah. 100%. Musically, absolutely. Where it was like 50% influence, now it's all down to like 10 as far as all the other bands that I've thrown into the ring for influence in these songs. But the business is like 90%. Yeah. Absolutely 90%. Because it's, you got to run it almost like well, you gotta run it like you're running a company. Yeah. People run it like a band. When you run a when you run a band like a band, it'll fail. But if you run a band like a brand, it will succeed. Nice. And Bon Jovi is a perfect example of how to do that, especially because you learned it from none other than Doc McGee. Yeah. Doc learned it from Bill Coin, who did stuff with Kiss. So when you can run it like a brand, and you can dabble with merchandising and your celebrity and who you are as a space, you will succeed. Yeah. But that's 
100% I can say that Bon Jovi's had an influence on that level. Like going back to you said, uh, you, you've you've noticed yourself using the same sort of formula as Bon Jovi, you know, whether it's the music or the writing. One thing that I would say is obviously the fans have said over, let's say, the last maybe even 18 years now, 19 years since Crushes, that Bon Jovi have used the same formula. And as, as a fan yourself, because obviously you listen to the band quite a, a fair bit, it seems. Would you say that you've noticed Bon Jovi using the same formula? Obviously, people say, you know, John uses the, the live my life quote a lot. Um, and I, I do get that, but mine's more like the production side. Our, our albums do sound quite similar. I mean, I did. I have to agree there was a different side, I thought, to this house is not for sale. And I I personally, from, from day one, I've loved the album. And I, I was only listening to it last night, to be honest with you. Um, I think it's I think it's a really really solid album from the band, but I I, I do understand what what some fans and I, I'll put my hands up myself included have said you know it's it's kind of the same it's the you know that the past few albums could kind of merge you could make one huge album out of it as a fan yourself do you see that in the band because obviously I'm not a musician I just go by what I hear so you you'll hear different things to me and you you'll pick up on things that I'd never pick up on so. Do you think that they use the same formula? Well, the formula, I've absolutely seen that, uh, the repetition of the formula, but it's not a bad formula. It's not a bad one because he knows what he speaks to. He knows that he's speaking to the American working man. He wants to talk about, it's my life. We have one shot at life, you know? Yeah. And then this new record, I like it because it's a similar formula, but it's a new one because he's almost accepting He's, a, he's really accepted um, his position. And it's cool to hear a very mature album. Not to say the other albums were immature. It's just that with all that went down on that uh, What About Now tour, he really had to step up and really take over as the leader. So I think from all that stress, all that time, he was able to do a a killer record that's just gritty and different and off the beaten formula. And I think I mentioned formulas earlier from those records, from like Crush On, I've used those formulas in my songs and I realized I can't do it half as good as they can. And I caught myself using that same formula and people were even saying, you, you sound, I mean, one person even said that we sound like the poor man Bon Jovi. Hmm. And I was like, what are you trying to say? <laughs> and, oh, Bon Jovi. So it, it definitely wasn't you know bad thing that we were copying the formula because it's, it's good songwriting structure. But also, I, mean, I was working with Desmond. He said, the formula is good. But for the music that you're trying to do, heavier, darker, you can't use that formula. You have to be interesting. Yeah. Like really, not that it's not an interesting formula, but when you put, like, let's say you take Metallica. Yeah. They have a formula where each song, I mean, like Master of Puppets is completely different than Enter Sandman or One or Nothing Else Matters. Mm -hmm. So you have to have these really obscure off the wall, off the wall formulas. And so I started writing, I try to think interesting. It has to be interesting. Another band that's a huge influence on us. Probably 50% of this album is 100% inspired by Ghost. Okay. And they have used the Bon Jovi formula a lot, where they'll go from like an A minor to F to C to G. Very popular formula, but it's a good formula. Like, it sounds great. It's the, it's my life formula. And I heard that, and I was like, that's cool. They're using Bon Jovi influence. Like their song Square Hammer it uses that formula in D, D minor, uh, F major, D minor. And that was a huge influence as well. But then their other songs were really obscure with their writing really melodic melodic as that formula but different yeah and weird and interesting so i i tried to learn from them and i always tried to throw in weird chords and stuff that are still melodic and make sense and i, I had to listen to a lot of grunge yeah that's a lot i mean Soundgarden, my god you know black hole sun he throws in some weird fucking chords in there man but it's a great formula and Thing with Alice in Chains, um, Ghost, Metallica, I had to really dabble with hard rock and listen to what makes a song interesting. Another great one too, Alice Cooper. 
same thing with Ozzy Osbourne. They have weird formulas, but the formulas are good. Yeah. I mean, Bark of the Moon, those are weird formulas in Bark of the Moon. They're like two key changes. But it's a great formula, man. And that's what it's all about, is staying interesting and not, you know, having to catch yourself when you're using that formula. And I've caught myself many times. But at the end of the day, it's only stupid if it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. Bullshit aside, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's only stupid if it doesn't work. But the, the lyrics that I picked up on that you, you were saying before, the kind of the lyrics that... Um, if you were to mention that the, the this house is not for sale album, the, the lyrics that always is most talked about, I'd say from from a Bon Jovi fan is "God bless this mess." So obviously we know what the the story behind "God bless this mess" is because you only need to see the music video where it's got the newspaper headlines and you know you see the aggression in in John's face when he delivers a couple of lines in the video. But the one I love that but I do I, yeah. like I think that's a fantastic video to be honest with you anyway. But the one, the one line that, or the, the, the one part of the, the song that we always pick up on is, obviously John says, me voice is shot, I'm going grey, these muscles all ache. And I, to be honest with you, in most, out of any Bon Jovi song, really, it's probably the, the most honest he has ever been, personally, I'd say. Um, obviously, we know a couple of stories from, this, from the These Days album and the Better Roses when he's admitted to going through a bit of a dark time. But that them lyrics in particular really strike us, and obviously we can all see that John's vocals obviously are what they used to be, and we get that he's obviously fifty seven or just turned fifty seven. Um, obviously he, he did used to smoke. Obviously he, he could belt out a song in the early eighties, nineties, and obviously that was probably no good on his main instruments. Let's be honest, but it could, you know. It, John's got a vocal coach, which we all know. Can you ever see John getting back to, say, like the 2010, 2011 standard of vocal? Because as, as I said there, he's, he's admitted himself that his, his voice is shot. And you can see that he's trying his best. Obviously, as I say, he's got a vocal coach. He's really pushing his vocal on a live performance. But can you see his, his vocals ever getting back to, as I said, even, two, even 2013 standard? Because obviously we did start to see a change as a fan in the late 2013 shows, but can you see a change? Can you see him getting back to how he used to be single wise? That's a great question. Um, you know, here's the thing. Paul McCartney is almost 80. Mm -hmm. 80? He is 80? I don't know what he is. Um, but his stuff, uh, he's still able to sing yesterday, a uh, little less die, all the really, early Beatles stuff, you know. But I think the same thing with like Paul Stanley, John Bon Jovi, Sebastian Bach. No one, it, it's incredibly difficult to write those kind of songs that are high and screaming and you're selling it and you're, you're young, so you're not really stopping and thinking, am I affecting my voice? Yeah. And time has you, you learned a lot about vocal cords since the 80s and the 90s. And, you know, you always think it sounds higher. Higher is cool. And they didn't really realize what was going on. Yeah. So, and I think you're trying, you know, it's, that's kind of like the same question as saying, will Michael Jordan ever be able to jump as high as he did? Mm -hmm. He's older. Yeah. And I, you know, John, I think what, again, with John, as his, as he gets older and all, you know, every, because again, a vocal cord is a muscle. Yeah. If you, if you mess up a muscle in your calf, you're gonna have a messed up muscle in your calf mm. forever. If you abuse your legs, if you abuse a muscle, it's gonna be abused. So I think what it comes down to is I don't think his voice will ever get back to slippery when wet. Um, it, or of, of course it's not gonna be that dramatic. You know, that's a huge jump. But um, I I see him getting back to um, like the it's my life vocal. I do. Wow. I see that, but I, I see that. Um, especially with the help of a vocal coach. Because I can tell when he sings now, he's not taking a risk. Because that's what people forget, too. When when an athlete rips, let's say he rips a, a, a tendon, everyone's sympathetic. Yeah. But when a, a singer says, I can't sing, everyone's saying, I made dinner plans with my wife, and I paid for parking, and I paid for this ticket, and you <laughs> fail. And no one's sympathetic. They're going, you're just a singer. It's like that same song, you know, Money for Nothing. 
everyone forgets that it's a muscle. And with age comes deterioration yeah. and callus and scarring and age. Yeah. You know? So I don't know if it'll ever be as strong as, of course, it's going to be so hard to say will it ever be as strong as everyone wet. But I think he, he works with what it is. Yeah. And I think that's what we got to remember is you got to stop thinking of what it was and what it is. That's yeah. what you got to remember. How is it going to be now and how is it going to affect the record and the sound of the band now? Because, hey, as long as he, here's how I see it, as from looking at the fans, how they respond and how he, and what they like from John, as long as he keeps his teeth curly white, <laughs> he, wears tight, he wears tight jeans, and you get the crowd singing along and he dances, records will sell. That's all that matters. And as long as he can still sing and perform and be the legend, John Bon Jovi, that's all that matters. See, uh, I... Uh, you got to remember what it is now. Yeah, I mean, I agree, I agree with, with the second part of that. Obviously, I, I love, I've always said, when John is on form, there is no better. That, that this is my opinion. When John is on form, there is no better front man. And nine times out of ten, I can kind of instantly say or see when he's going to be on form. I'm not obviously, you know, I'm a twenty-five year old male. So John, you know, in his tight pants, shaking it out like that doesn't do much for me. But obviously, the performance side is what I absolutely love. And as I said, there's no, you know, even to. Um, the Hall of Fame, you know, just seeing him move around and stuff like sometimes I, I forget, I do forget about his vocals. And you know, my mum went to see Bon Jovi with me in 2003, 2006, and 2008, but she still said in the Hall of Fame, God, he can really put on a show. And obviously, as a fan, I wouldn't go and see, you know, in the summer, I'm going to see four shows in six days. If it, you know, if it, if I thought John was that bad, I, I wouldn't go. Um, obviously, I would just love. As I said, I can see him trying his best and good on him because the man's a multi-millionaire. He could call it a day now. So obviously he's still got the desire, hasn't he, um, to, to yeah. perform and to, to write songs. And obviously that's what I'm saying. All, all I'd like, you know, just like to get to to get that side of you know your your opinion on that. But it, there was a rumor well, that also too. So, one thing that's great about it is that he knows what it comes down to, and we saw this in the uh, when we were beautiful documentary. Yeah, he saw. You can see the frustration in him when he's worried about the uh, the Central Park gig. Like, he thinks the tickets, and they want to do this. And the master wants to do this, and then he was getting frustrated. Yeah, because he wants to make sure that the fans are happy. Yeah, and when a fan has to save up money, buy the ticket, call a babysitter, live or drive over, pay for parking, walk to the people, pay eight dollars for a water, forty dollars for a t-shirt, get to their seat, deal with the sweatiness, deal with the bullshit, and then you say. You just put on a half ass show? Mm. Of course you did. Yeah. I saw Black Steps and I was covered in dirt because I had the last possible parking spot and it was totally worth it because they were fucking awesome. Yeah. And John knows that. John knows you have to be fucking awesome. And, you know, there's days that come along where with any artist, not just John, any artist, Jimmy Hendrix did the same thing, where people said, well, how come you didn't do the guitar behind your head but with your teeth? It's like, because sometimes life will sneak up on you at the very last minute with you right before you're about to do a huge gig and you're just miserable i've yeah. done that before absolutely i've been pissed off at someone before right before a big gig and i have to calm myself down and yeah every artist has you know has that but at the end of the day you gotta remember you're in a, you're an entertainer and mark slaughter i opened for him a couple times i actually did a project with him he um he taught me no matter if it's two people or two million bring it yeah you're an entertainer that's what you're getting paid for and if you're not looking and you're smiling at each other gonna suck yeah you know and there's times where a crowd can't get into it i, I did that the other day we we're doing a show and we're doing metal we're doing all this great stuff we're doing high energy and everyone's looking at us like we have three heads and it's like hello yeah. hi how are you like can we can we be alive and i and john you can see the frustration there he's trying to get a crowd into it and it's hard especially in nashville everyone's a musician so everyone is there to observe they're not there to party they're there to observe and that's the worst that's the fucking worst so I can see frustration there, but he still knows. And yeah. He still delivers. Which oh, yeah. is one thing I love about him is that no matter what, you have to step back, draw on perspective, and deliver. So oh, deliver the goods. Well, I'm going to ask obviously because, uh, like I, I get carried away. As I said, I'm loving listening to 
to your to your stories here. So we'll go back to when you obviously supported the band. Sum up in you know in however long you want to, because as I said, this is the, you know what we all want to hear. How was that experience for you to support the band? My first time was amazing. It was Nashville. It was my first Virginia show. It was really cool. But I, I was a deer in headlights, man. I didn't know what the fuck to do. I was like, uh, oh my god, oh my god, it's Nashville. Oh my god, there's there's a McIntyre sitting in the crowd. What do I do? And you're freaking out. But it was so cool. Mm. And I met Desmond Child there, and a bunch of family and friends came out. But the one that got me was when we did Salt Lake. My hometown. Mm -hmm. And I remember years before, I told my drummer, I said, you watch, I'm going to be playing that venue. And he goes, yeah, yeah, whatever. Two years later to the day, I'm doing it. Wow. And he was actually there, my old my old drummer, Eric Lindos. He was there, and he was running, he was, help, he was helping the show. He was doing sound for us. And we were back there, and it was super cool, and we did the sound check, and we did it, and we're like, oh, this is so cool. And he's like, what really made it special, we have all these friends back there, I have friends from high school, and family friends, friends of friends of friends that were there, it was cool. The coolest part was the venue found out the story and they gave me a custom snowboard. I posted on my Instagram, uh, the custom snowboard that says Jake J and the Killjoys. And everyone else in the band got a snowboard that said this has to not for sale, but I had a custom one. So I got the one that says Jake J and the Killjoys, it's all black, it's got the logo with the skull. With wow. the skull. And then I turned around and I saw a jersey, that there's a jazz jersey that said Johnson on it. And I, me and my mom saw that. We both looked at each other, and we just started fucking bawling. <laughs> because we, my grandma wanted me to play for the jazz. So to climb my way up and play in an arena and get my own jazz jersey, that was cool. But I always thought it was funny. I was like, I'm, I got my jersey, not from playing sports, but playing rock and roll. Yeah. And yeah. I thought that was, that was really magical. And the crowd, they were into it. I asked them, to, I, I don't know if you saw uh, everyone listening to this, and of course you will, um, you know, watch, uh, go on Dick Day and the Killjoys and look up Dick Day and the Killjoys Homecoming. It's the full concert from the Salt Lake show that was professionally filmed by Tony Bon Jovi. Uh -huh, okay. And, you see the, and it's got the, from the board, mix. So you're hearing the grittiness and the rock and roll. And it's kind of hard to hear the crowd because it's picking up our microphones. Yeah. But when I said... We're, although we're from Nashville, Tennessee, I was born and raised right here in Salt Lake City. The crowd was deafening. Wow. And then I had them put up their lights for the song Getting Older, and the crowd looked like stars. And they kept, and you know, what I usually do is like, pick your phone up, ah, my arm's tired, put it down. They kept their arms up the entire show. They ate it up. They loved it. It was, it was amazing. And that show was truly magical. And to have that footage as well made it even more special. Yeah. That's... And then the next day, and I remember we went down to Vegas. We're like, we're, we're in Utah. Let's go to Vegas. Let's see, let's see the Vegas Bon Jovi show. Then we go to Vegas. We're hanging out there. And the following day, I was I was pulling an all-nighter. No sleep. I had to carry my guitar to the airport. Four in the morning. I'm tired. I'm still sweaty from the show that we did. And I'm getting on the plane. And it's the funniest story ever. Because after that gig, Reality set in. I was on a plane. I was getting coughed on. There was a crying baby. I'm six foot eight. So I'm sitting there, and this guy, son of a bitch, in front of me is kicking a seat back and crushing my knees. And I start fucking falling. So I'm like, I have to go back to work. <laughs> Kill me. And, and fun fact, fun fact, during that time, for the first three months of 2018, I worked at an adult video store in Nashville. And the reason why is because I was broke. I had no interest in smut peddling. I have no passion for smut peddling. I did it because they gave me money. So I was like, I have to go from playing to 18,000 people to stocking pornos. This sucks. And then as soon as I got back to Nashville, I said, I quit. I'm done. I can't do this anymore. And another reason why I quit that job too, fun fact, I quit working the the, uh, the smut peddling because they wouldn't give me time off to go see Huey at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Wow. Fun story, right? Bloody go figure. Yeah. Jeez. And everyone is just sitting there going, I, I, I can see all these people listening to this and going, how do we get from Bon Jovi to sex tape? Where, where <laughs> are you going with this? True story though, it's true. 
Yeah, I, 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 have, I have no shame. I have nothing to hide. You're going to hear a lot of shit. Uh, listen, like, as I said, I'm, like, uh, I'm literally in shock and smiling and doing everything else, as you can probably see on here, listening to these. So uh, keep these stories going because, that, that, as you said, you know, we, we spoke on this before. People saying, oh, you've got to give in to you. Yeah, well, that story alone, you only have to say that story and that proves that you never, nothing's been handed to you, you've had to work for and you've had to make a risk of leaving the job where you've said you were broke to to do what you're doing now. So, you know, at the end of the day, no one can say that it's been handed to you well, yeah. because it hasn't. Well, even now, where it's not being handed. I mean, even tonight, I'm going to play downtown for four hours in Nashville playing at a bar where it, we're surrounded by Hong Kong fans and country music and pop music, and we're the only band doing 80s hair metal the entire night. Mm. I'm sure other bands will be like Sweet Child of Mine, Understand Man, but that's what we open up with. We're doing Deep Cut Ozzy, Deep Cut Bon Jovi, we're doing Deep Cut Def Leppard. We're doing a lot of stuff. And then when I'm not doing that, I'm in the studio. When I'm not doing that, I'm driving Lyft. When I'm not doing that, I'm doing that. If I'm not doing that, I'm writing songs. So I'm constantly working. And I was like, you know, Paul Stanley even said that he used to drive a cab. I'm a cab driver, man. Yeah. I, I drive people around in my car. I have a little Volkswagen Jetta that goes, and I drive people around. That's what I do. I, there is no, oh, Jake's living in a, you know, everything's getting taken care of. My, fa my family said, as soon as you start working, you're paying for shit. Yeah. And I said, all right. So, man, I, they make you pay for shit. Yeah. And there's, there's no... I mean, like, I, I spoiled myself on my birthday, but that's about it. Yeah. That is it. Everything else they say, you got to earn it. You got to earn it. Just, you're going to appreciate it more. And it's true. You really learn you, you learn that as you get older. Yeah. And you need some backstories. Uh, uh, we have a couple more minutes left before we have to get back to work here. But uh, I'm going to give you a couple more stories. Um, what? This is my way of promoting, uh, shamelessly promoting the new record. The song Relit Cigarette. That song, I was seeing this person, and they were they just broke up with their ex. We were dating for a little while, and it's the greatest story ever about a song. So we we you know we're, we're hanging out, and I'm like, I really like this person. I want to be with this person. So I asked, Do you want to make it official? I said, Absolutely. So we were in a we were in a full on relationship. We were. In a relationship, we were a thing. The next day, we broke up. Mm. It was their call. The time went on, and we uh, 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 it was kind of bouncing back and forth. I was stressing out about it. I was losing sleep over it. And I remember even, this is actually for two songs, um, I was at a buddy of mine's house, Kenny Baxter. We were doing a show together. And everyone's outside having a smoke break. I don't smoke, but I'm just hanging out, getting some air. It's like, oh, God, I my nerves. Stressing up forgetting songs, being a real asshole. I can't focus right now. We go to walk back into the house, and I look down at my shoes, and I'm like, I'm wearing bands. Why do I have a shoelace? And I realize there's a snake coming out of his house across my foot. Oh my God. And that's what, that was my omen. I said, This is a sign from the gods that I need to end this, if you want to call it a relationship, because there was literally a snake in the house, House of Snakes, which is on the new EP. You know, him a self promotion. So <laughs> then, so then time goes by, I end it. I keep seeing him around town. It's driving me nuts. And I say, we, we, we meet back up. And I say, do you want to try again? They said, no, I don't have those feelings for you. And I was like, all right. I was still having hope and false hope and just kind of clinging on a little bit because I just couldn't end it. And I was going through a lot of stuff at the time. And then I saw they got back together with their ex. And I was like, all right. This is dead. It's over. Yeah. And that was it. It was done. And that's actually a part in the song where I mentioned the death. This, the, uh, there's, there's a part, it's a bridge. I'm not going to spoil too much. But the bridge says, as I chase something I can kind of had, I know that you're never coming back. It's crystal clear, not hard to see that the Isle of You wasn't for me. As the coffin lid slowly closes, final nail driven in with roses, this love affair is dead. My friend, this is the end. That's wow. the funeral. And Jeez. pretty much the entire song talks about the tarot meaning of death, where it's moving on. There's a lot of references to death and moving on, old life dying and new life being born. 
And so I was like able to finally let go, and that's the whole song we let cigarette is about. So we're in the studio here, fast forward with another year. We're doing we're in the studio, we're working on the song. I'm listening to it in my bed, I'm with my cat tripod. Everyone, all the fans know about my cat tripod. Uh you got only has three legs, he's awesome. So I'm sitting there in bed, I'm listening to the song, and I'm just thinking about music video ideas, and I'm thinking about how is it gonna look live, how are we gonna do this with you know crowd interaction, how can we do this really cool? And I'm sitting there and I finally realized that when you the song is written about a couple. Mm-hmm. The song Real Cigarette is about a couple that when you put their names together, it's Astray. Like Astray for cigarette. Oh, I, I was trying, I thought you meant like an anagram. I've got to try and guess two names out of Astray. Yeah, so that's, so it's weird. Like their names put together is Astray and it's about relit cigarettes. Ah. I, I was like, that is a weird coincidence that that's just a weird little thing. And I, and this was a year after all this shit hit the fan. And I'm like, that's weird, man. How does that happen? And I was like, that's, that's why I'm sitting here going, man, this record's going to be amazing. Yeah. The old stuff, eh, there were some life experiences in it. This album is the dirt. Yeah. I couldn't put more blood, sweat, and tears into this record if I literally cried and bled onto the tape. There's no way. Yeah. This is as dirty of a record as it gets. You're getting as you're getting true authenticity from these songs and each song has a story. That, like so that, good, good on you though. Good. As you said, at least you've got you know, you you said there that your first album, you know, you had some personal things to write about, but at least now you feel like you've got a lot to write about and, and you're putting it into you're putting it into good use, I suppose. Well, like the old, like the old stuff, the last couple songs we recorded were honest. Yeah. They were about life. But they were still like little things like, I'm moving away. That was it. And we did like one song. It was getting older. Yeah. And even John heard that record. And when we wrote the song, I was going to write it strictly about me leaving this person that I, did, I fell in love with in Utah. And John said, or when I was writing with, the, with my producer, Joel Pat, he said, you got to write this so that anyone that can listen to it can make it their own story. So yeah. Said, You're right. That's a good point. So when I wrote it, and I, I sent it to John to say, hey, what do you think? There's nothing working on. He goes, this is cool because when I listen to it, I'm thinking about my kids getting older and oh. them doing their own thing. Wow. I'm like, that's cool. That's yeah. Like, every song has a story, really. But these new songs have stories. Yeah. These are, these are raw. I mean, we even have a song. The scariest one on here, I think, without a doubt, is a song called Jesus of Wrath. And it sounds like the song Holiday by Green Day. Ah, I love that song. If it was written by Finn Lizzy or Kiss and Marilyn Manson. Wow. If that does anything. And I wrote the song Jesus of Wrath because when we were unloading our car for a gig, we saw rats running up and down the street, and, and I never saw a real rat in the wild, or in a, in a city, I should say, until I moved to Nashville. And I was having one of those days where I'm on Broadway, and I'm in a shit mood, and I'm just like, looking around, and there's bombs asking for money, people getting robbed, yeah, rats running around, and I'm just like, I'm the Jesus of rats. And I was like, oh, hey, there's a title. And <laughs> it just stuck. And the song, I don't know what it's about, but it makes sense. Yeah. It's just it's just for those people that have a they have a chip on their shoulder. They wanna they just wanna cause a little bit of shit. Yeah. That's what it's about. It's just, it's just, it's just a nasty rock and roll song. Uh, That's you... the best thing about rock and roll. I heard a best and they got some Buck Terry, they said a great rock and roll song makes you want to dance fight or fuck. So that's <laughs> That's all I gotta say about it, and that's what this—that's what this record will make you do. Yeah. Not so much the dancing, but the other stuff. Yeah. Have you have you still got a little bit of time? Just answered a few questions that people have sent in. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, 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 burn through those, and I'll, I gotta do vocals for the song Guillotine. 
Ah, uh, okay. So uh, what I'll do is I'll go, uh, like I've been sent them through everything, WhatsApp, um, okay. Gmail, Twitter, as you've seen. Um, to be honest, it's it's been quite a, a good response, to be honest with you. Um, so I'll, I'll just go through and I'll see the names of, of who's asked what, uh, because obviously I presume that they'll be listening to the podcast. Um, so... I, I'm not too sure whether they're asking about your album or the new Bon Jovi album, but somebody has put, can you give us an estimated date on when their album will be out? So if you know the answer for both, or if you, you know, obviously just get, get, presume it's uh, it's asking for either, if, if that's okay. Well, um, as far as Bon Jovi goes, I have no idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're you're asking the janitor at the White House with the president, what the president's up to. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know nothing. I really don't. Um, as far as Dickie and the Killjoys is concerned, uh, the new EP will be out. Um, we're hoping uh, spring. Okay. Maybe early summer, late spring. Yeah. Um, just because we're going to try. Uh, I'm working with a, a, a dear friend named Joey Amato, who I actually met through Desmond Child. And he's kind of just become my manager. It's like, we're a contractless manager, if you want to call it that. And yeah. he just kind of said, I'm your manager. You know? So we're trying to come up with a plan because he's been in the business and he's young and he knows social media and the numbers and what needs to go down and he understands what's going down. Yeah. He's, um, we're going to try to take it to people. We're going to take it to Doc. We're going to take it to Des, John, Ken Sunshine. We're going to take it to everybody we know and we're going to see what happens. And if everyone says, no, just release it on your own. We're going to release it on our own. Yeah. And we're going to book a tour on our own. We're going to do something on our own. And we have some stuff in the works that I don't want to say out of, out of uh, fairness. To, I don't want to jinx it. <laughs> but all I can say is the fall is looking very busy. Okay. Sounds interesting. The next one. So that was from Cat Lat seventy two. Just just in case, as I said, she's listening. Uh, this one's okay. from Eddie seventy three rocks on Twitter. So this is actually one that I was going to ask you before he actually tweeted this. To be honest with you, so his question is: What are the chances of the Killjoys being on the bill for any UK gigs before the Manic Street Preachers, who obviously are supported like the main support act for Bon Jovi? And have you got any UK club shows lined up at all? Extremely unlikely. Okay. Extremely. Because I say that because with how the business works, a lot of it will be um, label or agent relationship and favors. That's all this business is about. It's yeah. about, you know, when it comes down to labels and those guys, it's favors and who is going to work with this band because. It sounds similar, and so we're going to have this artist play with this guy. So if you have two artists that sound similar, one's very popular, one not so popular yet, like if we were signed up with Island, for example, of yeah. course they would put us with John Bon Jovi, but we have nobody. Yeah. So it would be hard for us to come up with $100,000 to go on tour, get fans, get plane tickets, get gear, catering, and life, yeah. and hotel. Yeah. No, it would be hard for us. Yeah. Um, I, would, I would kill to go over there. And do a show. It's just, it's just, it's, it all comes down to money and um, who's working with who and what they have up their sleeve. Because there's all, there's so much stuff going on. But I, if I got the call tomorrow saying, "Hey, get on a plane, go to UK," you would, I mean, it'd be happening. But yeah. I, I, I just don't see it happening right now. Fingers crossed, as you said, you never know what can happen. So fingers you crossed. Know. Touch wood. Know. But I, I, but UK is not off the table. That's yeah. gonna happen. Soon. Yeah. It's a matter of when and how and who's paying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Listen, when, when obviously when you are, let us know because I know when you know just from I said that the Bon Jovi page that I run, there's a lot of there's a lot of people who who would like to see it at the shows. Um, of course. Because uh, you no, know, I one thing that I always remember on Twitter before when when Bon Jovi was saying that they were going to get you know like bands to to support them. I, the amount of people that said your band should be 
be opening up for them is crazy. So there's definitely a, a, a demand of some sort for you to, to come over here and, and for people to see you. So hopefully one day it does it does come true. It would be great. Cause I know I know our music would do very well in the UK because I know London loves rock and roll. Europe loves rock and roll. Australia yeah. loves rock and roll. America is more pop, but I would love to get me with Europe. It would be it would be amazing. Yeah. Would, we would love to race some hell. And I always said if we ever did um, the UK, I want to open the show with Anarchy in the UK by the Sex Pistols. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. We're, we're, we like punk rock, so it'd be fun. But yeah, so eventually, just not at the moment. Yeah. Um, Zoop Som on Twitter has said, What are your favorite Bon Jovi songs? Again, something I, I, I was going to ask you myself, but because these are already here, I don't even have to. Believe it or not, as far as songs go, uh, mainstream ones, uh, of course, Prayer. Yeah. It gets stuck in your head. I've heard it a million times, it never gets old. Um, my favorite Bon Jovi song, it's kind of a toss-up. I love Raise Your Hand. Yeah. It's so much fun. And um, one of my favorites, believe it or not, the deep one, is One Wild Night. Oh, what a song. song. Great song. I was it's listening great. to that before. That's a great song, man. I love it. And Dry County, of course, because that's going to be the best Ricky solo ever. Yeah. Uh, Agreed. I think it's my favorite. Yeah. It's, it's, I, of course, I love Slippery When Wet in New Jersey. Can't beat those. Those are the shit. But um, I don't know, it just depends on my mood each day. Maybe they like more popular, maybe they like more deep cuts. But I would, I would say Prayer, Raise Your Hand, and um, One Wild Night. Yeah. As far as, let, let's do a deep one. So, yeah. Good one. Good, good choices, to be fair. Um, yeah. Somebody has kind of asked three. One of them I've, I've kind of already asked. So it, it was, what was your reaction to Hugh McDonald's induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? We've kind of briefly went over that one, I suppose. Um, but then the other two are, are, are pretty good. So the first one I'll ask you again, we've kind of gone over it, but I haven't really asked how it influenced you. So someone's put, has Bon Jovi's music influenced your sound? And if so, how has it? So obviously you touched on like the formula and, and obviously being a fan of the band that like you've used certain ideas that the band have done, but how has it influenced you? What made it influence you, your music? Well, as far as Hugh's induction, it was great. It was awesome. It was cool to see. You know, he's always done so much for the family. It's cool for him to have a moment. To have like, yes, I mean, you know, this is my night. Yeah, that was cool. Um, as far as sound, of course, melody and structure and formula. That's of course that that has been an influence. I've had to be careful though because I have almost too much influence on it. Yeah, so I really dial back and get more sinister and metal sounding. You know, which is kind of weird to say, but then again, if you take Avenged Sevenfold, you can hear it and go, man, that's a Bon Jovi melody, or you hear, oh, that's metallic. Yeah. And that's kind of the pocket we have. So it's like pop metal, almost, dare say. But it, you know what? It's, you know, a lot of people will talk about metal, oh, they're posers, they have melody. And it's like, so? It's only dumb if it doesn't work. And they're selling out stadiums all over the world. So no yeah. one's one buying tickets, they're going to keep doing it, you know? And that's kind of the same pocket we sit in, and I'm already preparing myself to hear those things, those comments from metal fan things. They're not real metal. <laughs> but go listen to Slayer. Okay, I love Slayer too, but even Slayer said, guys, calm down. You can listen to other music. You can listen to Michael Jackson and Animal Corpse. Okay. So that's one thing I have to say about that. Um, was there a third part of that question? Um, how, how has it influenced your, your sound? And of course, formula and structure and melody. Yeah. Yeah, I would say it's had 20%. I, in the old stuff, I'd say it's about 50%. The new stuff, I'd say about 15%. The other question that this person asked was, and I, I, I'm intrigued to, to know this answer, what's your favourite Hugh McDonald bass riff or slash part? Ooh. Well, of <laughs> course, you, you have songs like... Um, very obvious bass line, but yeah. living on a prayer. Yeah. And um, I don't know the one. Uh, keep the faith. Yes. Yeah. Where it's his time to shine. Yeah. I love keep the faith because to me that sounds like sympathy for the devil. Got a group got you know like you want to bob your head and go yeah it's blues. Keep yeah. Faith. You know it's cool. My favorite bass line though, without a doubt, 
is Born to Be My Baby. Uh -huh. His fingers never stopped moving that entire song. Wow. And you hear the R&B influence, and you have this like, light a candle, blow the world away, that kind of tempo. Yeah. But if you took that, if you took that song, like let's say you took John Foy and Hugh's bass, and you gave the music to like Quincy Jones or some R&B band. Yeah. That's a fucking R and B beat, and he's, I mean, his bass line's doom, 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 If you put like an offbeat disco thing to it, yeah, that's a killer R and B bass line, and he learned that from playing with Gladys Knight and the Pips and all those guys. So that's cool too, and I, I, that bass line alone has inspired a lot as far as just adding different musical styles into one style. Yeah, so you can have R and B influence, you can have country influence, you have metal, rock, pop, you know, pop, punk, polka. And you can make some cool music together. And so that's, yeah, without a doubt in my mind, it's going to be my baby because that is, it sits in the pocket so well, sounds great, and it's just cool. As you said, that obviously for a fan, like Keep the Faith is the one that instantly strikes. As you said, it's it's huge time to shine. But that, that that's why i was intrigued that's why i can't save that that was the first question they asked but i wanted to save that one to last because i think that's it's interesting to know what your your answer to that one is so i i kind of left that one to last to be honest out of their questions that is anyway um yeah. so that was from k2 lou santa fe um kev Bourne has asked so you've actually i think you've seen one of these on twitter it was um, how long has your dad been playing on the Bon Jovi record? So as you said, he, he played on Runaway and then nothing so slippery and New Jersey onwards. Um, and then the second one is how likely is Hugh to come on the podcast? So I'll let you, I'll let you answer that one. Okay. Uh, part one of that question, um, he's been involved since day one on Runaway. Mm -hmm. And then after when John had the single and had to get a band together, he brought in Alex. You can tell Runaway is definitely like not Bon Jovi with Richie, Pico, David. It's Huey, and I forget who else was on it, but it's like Skid Row was the backing was the backing band for that song. And um, you have to look up the specs on that. I'm not totally sure. Look at Wikipedia that. And um, and then when they, they did Fahrenheit, it was Bon Jovi the band. And then you see Slippery, and they said we got to bring in you know Desmond Child was involved, Bob Rock was involved, yeah. Huey was involved. They had to up their game. And it was actually Paul Stanley who got Desmond Child involved. His doc. Was, you know, managing Bon Jovi, Bon Jovi was on the road to hit, and he said to Paul, this band needs a hit. And he says, here's Desmond Child's number, give him a call, you will have a hit. And it was even in Paul's book, he said, yeah, and then after giving that number, they came out with Living on a Prayer, of my hit, you know. Yeah. And, and that's funny to hear. So, um, yeah, so I, I think QE really shown some magic to the songs because he's just, again, the R&B feel, the pocket, the groove. The way the, the McCartney bass line meets funk and soul. Yeah. Of course, he did that. Um, Huey getting on the podcast. I can't even call him to talk about my bill. <laughs> 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 that, you know, that Huey, he's watching dog videos and drinking Jameson right now. I, I highly doubt that it's because he's getting ready for stuff. He's hanging out with my mom. He's taking some time to enjoy the stillness of not touring and recording yeah so he, you know what i mean yeah yeah totally so he's on a vacation at home yeah <laughs> totally understandable because it's soon it's going to be a long a long journey again for him yep uh so andy who is his twitter name's the real six string he has said and this is actually a good one uh Again, this is kind of a two-part question. He said he'd be interested to know if having a successful musician as a stepdad was at times more difficult than people might imagine, and was there extra pressure and expectation to be good, um, and were some of the doors closed because of the mentality of Hugh MacDonald as in Bon Jovi? All right, that's a fucking awesome question. It is. <laughs> that's, that's so, um, Um, problems with having a dad as a musician, there were problems because you know, he's on the road, so you don't see him for a month or two. But it's also, you understand it. Um, you don't, I mean, and that's one thing I've learned too with life is that I have a problem where I really love the idea of having someone to talk to. Yeah. 
But that's so hard now, especially when you're Bon Jovi, you go out on the road and you're playing to Madison Square Garden and you're staying in a five star hotel and you're on a private jet. Yeah. It's hard, but it's easy because you're away from what you really want with the family. Yeah. For me, not, right now, God damn it, I gotta, I, I, you do a show, you get in a van, you drive, you don't sleep, and you just live off burgers and shit. It sucks. And you're always on the road, you know, it can be a lot harder. And I've, we, haven't even, we haven't even really toured yet, but I know that's what lies ahead. Yeah. And it's gonna, it's, you know, it's gonna be hard. But it's also, it pays off because, you know, he's put my sister through college. He's, he's paid for her wedding and he's putting me through my college of hard knocks and he's supported me along the way. Um, as far as expectations, absolutely. There's been expectations. Because the thing is, too, when you're in a small town, like when I was in my small town, when I said, oh, I'm going to Nashville, whoa, that's so cool. And you seen as almost like like the celebrity of the town. And that's kind of what I've become in, in Colville, like this little celebrity. But really, how I see it was, it is what it is. And then when you get to Nashville, it's not really so cool that, you, that you're the hero of your small town. There's this, there's this expectation to always be better. Yeah. Always write the best song. To always, you know, and I, that's the one thing too about being in Nashville, getting the opening slot, opening for the people we've opened for, doing the cruises. No one gives a fuck who your dad is in Nashville. Yeah. No one gives a fuck who you've opened for, whatever. Because the guys that play Broadway, there are guys that play the Grand Ole Opry. There are guys that had a record deal. There's guys that have sold a ton of records. Yeah. It doesn't matter. What matters is the song. That's what matters. And it's so weird because you'll see Jason Aldean, he'll have his own bar, and he's selling millions of records and all these shows, selling out stadiums all over the world. But then you see the greatest, most like beatle like, god like performer, singer, songwriter playing friends in low places, and you're like, what the fuck is yeah. going on? So there is absolutely expectations and i even remember huey like i'll mess up a part on a song and i could time it because my room was right above his office he would come upstairs and show me the part have it be ozzy osborne bon jovi def leopard get up to find out those parts and so yeah having the dad in the band helps yeah because it opens a door but even though that door is open there's still a real big bouncer blocking your way in that's the best way I can describe it. Yeah, which uh, that's totally understandable, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, and he showed me that being a rock star is not cool. What matters is being a, a great entertainer, yeah. a businessman, and a professional musician. Having gear that works, stays in tune, make sure you know your shit, get on and off stage, be professional, thank you, no thank you, stay before the show, stay after the show, talk to other bands, Network, socialize, take any gig you can, and dare to suck. Yeah, yeah. Dare to fail. That's what he taught me. And so there's been expectations. There's been you, you're constantly craving for validation. And you know he's always supported me along the way, but he's always the first one to say that sucks. Do it again. Yeah. I mean, he's not been cruel about it. He hasn't thrown chairs at me like in whiplash or anything. But he has told me. <laughs> That was so great. Let's try it again. Yeah. You know, that's not right. Do it again. So that's, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a great question, but that's, that's the honest to God truth. I could make that up if I tried. These, it is a very good question. Um, to be honest, a lot of these are, to be honest, there's only a couple left. If you've still got time, I don't want to, I don't want to keep you away from, from work. No, no, absolutely. Let's go for it. Brilliant. Cheers. So um, I think I've got only got a couple on Twitter. And then I said, I've got one or two. Um, on like one a couple are on twitter messenger and then whatsapp and email but there's only like one or two on them um wildflower 80s has said is it true that the set lists are entirely up to john and the band have nothing to do with it and is it true he decides on what's going to be played half an hour before the gig half hour no they'll have the set list hours before the show mm -hmm. uh -huh. As far as deciding songs, I don't know. I do know that John makes the decision on whether or not he wants to play always. Because it's a very tough song to sing. Yeah. And, um, yeah, honestly, I, don't, I have no idea on that one. Fair enough. Um, wait, so that's all the Twitter ones. 
Tell you what, here's a little fun fact. 18 minutes ago, you know Lorenzo Ponce? Mm-hmm. She's asked how I do a podcast with her, so fingers crossed she can come on soon. Um, somebody has said here, oh, actually, sorry, that's in an email. So he sent me to this guy. Um, so he says, does Hugh have any details on this? And it's a show that he done with, I think it's a show that he done with Poison in 1998, is it? Uh, What's doing again? Uh, with Poison. No idea. Yeah, it says Bobby. Bobby, it's it's like a little article on the Poison Fan Club dot net that he sent me to, um, saying that Bobby Bobby Doll was too ill to perform. Hugh McDonald steps in, so I think he was sad. Oh, that show. That, yeah. Oh, okay. That's a fucking Poison <laughs> show. Yeah. Okay, that's fucking awesome. So, um, yeah, we go to a Poison show. Bobby was sick as a dog. I mean, he he was. I mean, I, 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 oh my God. I mean, like he was sick as a dog. It was, it was horrible. And so we're backstage. We're there to see Cheap Trick, Poison, and Def Leppard. That's when you said 1998. That's where I got confused. I realized it's only like 2008. That's where I got confused because the, the connection is so bad from where we are. Um, so we're sitting there. We see Cheap Trick. They were awesome. We're sitting there. All of a sudden, Poison walks up to Dewey and says, want to play bass with us? He's sick. We're like, he's like, Fuck it, sure, why not? Yeah. And me and my mom are going, oh my god, he's going to play with Poison. Because he likes, you know, I mean, he likes the guy from Poison, but he's not a Poison fan. Because he's, he's old school. I mean, this is Huey we're talking about here. Let's the Beatles in the Yardbirds. So he goes to do, so we're in the crowd, we're watching the show. He goes to play with Poison, and one time gig, goes to play with Poison. Def Leppard's on one side of the stage watching the show, Cheap Tricks on the other, because they're just like, no way this is happening. And the keyboard player, who's actually here in Nashville, he's yelling at Huey to go, no. he's like waving his arms at him. And he's thinking, I need to step back. No, he's telling him to move forward because he's standing right in front of a pyro jet. So the fireball goes right up his back on the song, look at the cat, uh, look at the cat dragged in, right up his back. And Huey, instead of jumping forward like a, like a, like a scalded cat, goes, he does this little like suave face move, little like, Blinky face move, like, oh, there's a fireball right behind me. And you look to the side of the stage, Cheap Trick and Def Leppard are on the ground laughing. I saw Rick Nielsen rolling around on the ground. He couldn't breathe. He was laughing so hard at Huey getting blown up by poison. And that was awesome. That's all I got to say about that. That's the best fucking story ever. And if you talk to any of the guys in Def Leppard or Cheap Trick, they will tell you exactly that same story. On, you know, Poison will say the same story. It's awesome. So that's the death plan that Huey saved the day for Poison, and they almost killed him. Wow. That's a, it'd be made up with that answer, to be honest with you. Because uh, as I said twice, he, he messaged me on um, Twitter, and then he messaged me on, like, me, me Gmail account. So it'd be absolutely made up to, to hear that. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. Uh, this is from Eddie seventy three Rock. So again, this is in my DMs. Um, he has said. Now I, I, I've said to him. My reply was, I'll give you the option, obviously, to to say no to any of these questions that you don't want to ask because I don't want you, obviously, to to say something okay. you shouldn't. Uh, he Eddie seventy three Rocks has said, "Do John and Richie still talk after the Hall of Fame? And can you see Richie joining the band again?" All I have to say to that is this. Like I said before, that's like asking the janitor at the White House what the president is up to. Yeah. I don't know shit. Literally. My dad's in the band, and I have no idea. I get asked that question every day, and I said, I know as much as you do. Yeah. Word of God. That's yeah, yeah. Truth. I said, like, my, my and I, you know, I'll screenshot it. I, I did say, you know, I'm going to say, um, like, I don't want to just ask you that. I'll obviously make sure that you know, I give you the option to say no. I, I totally understand. Uh, well, I knew that was that was going to be a question. Yeah, always, of course. To be honest, always predict it. So, so did I. <laughs> I knew. I knew when once I said once I said to you, you know, do you mind if fans ask? I knew that was going to be one of the first ones. To be honest, um, yep. let me just go back. I think I've got one more to ask you. Um, I think that might be in the DMs. Oh, it's to light. It was the same guy. Um, 
do you think uh, you've kind of already answered this to be honest will richie what was it like with richie being on the album and do you think that um you'll work with him again in the future it was awesome and i would love to yeah uh, like, from earlier, yeah, I would, I would, I would love to do another song with Richie. It's just a matter of when, where, and how. Yeah. Do you so, think? Um, would you? Would you? Th- this is my own question, sorry, but would you? Would you, do you think you'd ever get any of the other band members involved? With, like, would you like any of them to to be involved with your album? Oh yeah. Oh, after Phil X, I'd love to have Phil or John, Richie, Chico, David, Shank. I would love to have any of them. Yeah. Really, it's just a matter of, you know. Especially now with this hard rock stuff, me going up to someone like Shane, um, he, I would even ask him for him to introduce me, but he's always so busy working with Bon Jovi and other artists. Yeah. And plus, he's also a very expensive, where I literally have a Sizzler coupon and some loose change. That's all I have. Yeah. So um, I would love to. It's just a matter of, at this point, when, where, and how. Yeah. And it'd be, it'd be tough now, especially because we're going the heavier route. Because, you know, it's, it's not like a bad thing. It's not like saying, would Bon Jovi play with Marilyn Manson or Slipknot? It's just like, it's like, would, you know, would you see Bon Jovi playing with Green Day or Avenged Sevenfold? Yeah. You know what I mean? That's how I would best compare it. That's what we've been compared to. That's it. That'd be cool. I don't see it not happening, but I wouldn't hold my breath on it because I know that they are in their, they're in Bon Jovi world. Yeah. And I'm in Dick Jansen Killjoy's world. Yeah. It's different. Of course. So it's just a matter of when. Right. Listen, I have nearly kept you up, so I don't want to keep you any longer. As you said at the start, you know, you you currently in the studio, so um, you know, I, I won't keep you any longer. I've asked the the questions that the fans want to eat because I could literally sit here and listen to these stories all day. Um, <laughs> honestly, it's it. I've been up since five fifteen this morning, and it's nearly twelve a.m. now. So I've literally, wow. I know, so, but I did, trust me, it's been worth it, it really has. Um, so all I've got to say is, you know, listen, thanks thanks very much for coming on the podcast, taking time out of your day to, to speak about everything. Um, Absolutely. Because it's, it's been very, honestly, by far the most interesting podcast I've done to date. And as I said, I could literally sit here for a couple more hours and, and listen to more. Well, I appreciate uh, the questions. Every question was very, uh, it was informative, it was intelligent, it was about the band, it was 50-50 about the, you know, the band, Bon Jovi. I love sharing these stories, and if anyone wants to know any more stories after the podcast, if you want to ask, ask on Twitter, if you want to message me or shoot me an email on jkandakiljoys.com, by all means do. And if you want to know what's going on, if there's new merchandise coming out, or if there's a show coming up, by all means, feel free to ask because sometimes we're so busy that we forget to keep people informed of what's going on. We don't want to just keep talking about what's going on. What's going on. We only want to announce on what is going on for sure. We don't want to tease anyone. We don't want to give any false information. So by all means, if anyone has any more questions, feel free to ask on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, the website. But So everyone, we love hearing from the fans. Send us any pictures of you wearing the merch or singing the songs. We love it. It gives us the fuel to keep going. So I, I really appreciate this. And all the fans, thank you for the support and the love and the request to play in your town. We want to. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of when, how, and how much. Yeah. <laughs> you know? No, honestly, as a, and listen, but, you know, as, as much as you thank and everyone for giving you the, answer, the questions, but me personally, I'd like to thank you for, for all the answers, as I said, because... You know, without 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 the answers, they wouldn't be good questions. So honestly, I I really appreciate um, you taking the time out and ask and and answering in the way you did. Absolutely, anytime, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your night. Ah, uh, thanks very much. Listen, I hope everything goes well, and fingers crossed, I do get to see you in the UK sometime. Very soon. Very soon. <laughs> thanks very much, Jay. I do appreciate it. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Sweet soup. Ta-da. Bye. Have fun.